All right, Julia, how you doing? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit stressed, but yeah, yeah. I, it's okay I'm to sure. be stressed. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I know this is a it's a crazy time right now. I saw your video the other day you put up on the on the Adored Beast page. It was a great video, great watch. And uh that was really awesome. Thank you. How are you holding up? Um I think that um yeah, it's it is um it is it is really it is a really really weird time. I feel like I'm really um not getting tested, but you know when I I used to always say to people, um, you know, you have to walk your walk your talk or practice what you preach or whatever whatever terminology you want to use. Right. And I feel like, you know, I'm out there and I'm telling everybody it's okay and we're resilient and it it's it's good and I I feel like okay. It's always I always feel like I'm being um not tested, but yeah in a way, in a way tested so that I can, I can stand from experience and talk about stuff because we were supposed to be doing this live at my mom's farm. Yeah. Right. And then I wasn't able to go because of the coronavirus. Right. And then my mom got really sick and wound up going to the hospital and um, it's been, no one could go in and we couldn't like, basically it was just talking to people on the phone and talking to nurses and you know trying to talking to doctors and just trying to navigate everything that was going on in the hospital she didn't go in for a coronavirus issue um or anything like that so they wanted to get her out but then oh i'd be calling the hospital and it would it would literally say like even this morning i called um my mom's palliative care unit like she's at home now but, and I'm trying to get home, but all the provincial borders are closed. So even if I get in my truck and just keep, and just drive, I can't get across without a doctor's note through, through the different provincial borders. Mm -hmm. And then I phoned this morning to go, where's my, where's my letter? I need my letter because I want to come home. And, um, and I was phoning and it was going, all circuits are, all circuits are busy at the moment. Like you couldn't even get through on, on, on a, on a, on a regular line. Stressful. Well, it's really, it's, it's odd. That's the only, like, it's super stressful. And then my donkey got really sick and almost died last night. Oh my gosh. I'm down there. And I'm calling my equine vet and everything that I'm reading is like, you can't be around your animals right now. So the vet will have to, go down there alone and you won't be able to even be around your animal. And I thought maybe I was going to have to put him down and I'm like, okay, just breathe. So then he got here and he's an incredible guy, but it was so weird. Like we were trying to stand seven feet away from each other, you know, and talk and we couldn't like walk through the same doors together. Like it's, it's really, really, really an odd time. And, and, you know, I had to practice a lot of what I was preaching yesterday about trying to stay grounded and mm -hmm. trying to just look at this from a much higher level and in sort of understanding the lessons behind it or i would have just had a meltdown last night here's right. my donkey gonna die my mother's dying i can't get to ontario like it's just it's it i'm on the phone 24 7 then i can't even get i can't even get a I phone call I think that's, that's one of the things that I admire most about you and look up to you a lot of, for is your, is your willingness to your, you stay grounded and, and you, you can always kind of look, even you can look back and, and you, you see what's most important. You know, in, in our past lives, we talked about, uh, one was about your upbringing and your, what, you, what you do, your, your, um, your accomplishments. But then our second one was about the emotional aspect of cancer and end of life care and euthanasia. And it, that I I keep going back to that chat. I've watched it a, a bazillion times because I pick up on something new, or it reminds me. Uh, to, it brings me back, and and I'm reminded of what I should be doing, you know, um, instead of just kind of spinning out of control. So that's one of the things I've always admired about you is your your groundedness. Well, thank you. Like I don't always feel like that. <laughs> You know, like it, I have to, I have to, it's not like it comes naturally. I, I have to really, yeah, 
Um, I guess part of it comes naturally. My mom used to say to me, my mom used to say when I was like little and we would have all of these rescue dogs, which will lead into what we're going to talk about. But we had, you know, all of these rescue dogs at our farm, right? Like my mom rescued dogs since I was three years old. And there would just be tons of dogs all over the place and running around and, you know, they would get into, into fights and it, <laughs> um, or something would happen and somebody would get cut or somebody would get hurt and everybody would be running around like, you know, losing it. And, you know, my sister who was 10 years older than me would be like, oh my God, get this and oh my God, get that. And like, oh, I'm going to call a vet. And everybody's like freaking out. And my mom said she would turn around and I would just be sitting there like my hand on the cut, like, cause I'd seen my mom do that before. So I would just have like a paper towel or something, or even just my hand on the cut, just like sitting there, like kind of just, mm-hmm. <laughs> just not, not even thinking. I wish I had that now. I still have it a little bit when I have to. And then what happens to me is I say super grounded. I say super, super solid in the, emer- in the crisis. And then as soon as it's done, then I'm like kind of semi crash. Yeah. yeah. And I sounded, I, I talked to a shaman about that, right? Like I talked to a shaman about like, you know, this sort of feeling where how strong I have to stay and then, and then actually getting sick after sometimes. Right. Because I, I. You're using up all your. All everything, mm-hmm. my every energy, right. Like physical, mental, emotional, yeah. spiritual. And what she said is, and that's sort of what I was talking about yesterday or on the live, is that um, uh, about allowing your emotions to happen, right? So, you know, different cultures and stuff wail, you know, so when an animal dies or a person dies or a loved one dies, once, you know, they do have the whole ritual and everybody supports them to move, move on. And then after they actually go through this like massive, like wailing and crying and, and what that does is it is allows that energy to move through. So it doesn't get stuck so that you don't get sick. Mm -hmm. So I do that a lot. And sometimes if I'm really in a place where I feel like I'm still hyper, too hyper vigilant or I'm too like too solid or I'm being too strong and I, but I can feel myself feeling like, okay, I feel like I'm going to implode. Um, I'll just go and I'll listen to music or something. And then as soon as I listen to certain pieces of music, I'll just start bawling. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I purposefully do that to try and just release stuff. But yeah, it, it's healthy. Interesting. Pardon? That's good. That's healthy. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people allow themselves to do that. Right. I love, like they I love, don't. Allow I'm a crier. Emotion. You're a crier? I'm a crier. Oh, good. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we were talking about being scared too, right? It's okay to yeah. be scared. It is. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not, not scared that my mom's going to die before I get there. I'm obviously really scared that something's going to happen and she's going to die before I get home. Right. Yeah. Or I'm going to go home and she's going to be okay. And then my donkey's going to die while I'm gone. Or like, yeah, to say that I'm not worried or I'm not scared about all of that stuff, mm-hmm. I would not be telling the truth. I am, but I don't think I'd be human if I wasn't. Before we get started, um, how many, I want to know how many animals, what, what kind of animals do you have on your farm? Oh man, didn't the last time I talked to you, I was, I looked like I got run over by a bunch mm-hmm. of animals. I just mm-hmm. rescued like eight yeah, horses. a bunch of horses, right. Yeah, you have, every time we jump on, uh, it's just something crazy. I love it. <laughs> Oh, and like last night, I, I was like, okay, was this deja vu or did this really happen? This morning I got up and I was rushing around again because I had to go down and check on him and I had to give him some meds and I had to make sure he was okay and I'm running around and I look down and it's like, oh my God, like even though I had a shower, I have, I know I have like horse shit under my face. But, but, that's, but, but that's like, you're, that's, your, that's your every day. So I think, you know, it's beautiful to... You know what I mean? Like, not, not, wasn't that the last time I was talking to Peter? Like the same thing happened. I was only, I think I had it on my hair and everything. Like I wasn't able to even have a shower. So yeah. that's pretty funny. Right. So I have, I have um, eight, nine rescue horses. I have a rescue donkey. I've got two rescue goats. I have two rescue cows. I have a rescue pot-bellied pig. 
What do you do about, have, what do you do about coyotes? Or, I love coyotes. Or, coyotes do, and I live synergistically together. Do the donkeys protect I, the other animals? The coyotes could care less about the other animals. My chickens are free range. I have guinea hens. I've never touched wood. I've had them taken by eagles, yeah. eagles and owls. But um, I, I, you know, if you have a farm, you have rats. There's just no other way around it. Like if you have grain or you have chickens and you live on a farm, you are going to have mice and rats. It's just, it's just the way it is. And I allow, like I'm anal about my coyotes. I don't let anyone hunt on my property. I love them. I'm not afraid of them at all. And I have two um, that come and they hunt rats on my manure pile every morning. And I can watch them like just as dawn's coming up and they'll, they're up on the manure pile and then they look and they're like, they're like totally quiet. And then they jump in the air and then they go into the manure pile and they come out and you can just see them like chomping on a mouse or chomping on a rat and then swallowing them. <laughs> so that's why I like <laughs> we live synergistically. I get mad at my dog if they chase them. I love them. Um, yeah, they're awesome. That's Very, I, that's an amazing life. Well, when I lived in BC, it's it's incredible when I, when you talk about just animals in general. Um, I was never scared of coyotes because we had wolves and coyotes growing up on our farm. But um, I lived on something that they call a path passway, and in BC, it's really wild, right? So where I was up on this ridge, when I had my farm out there, I lived on this ridge and there was a valley and we built a pond and the forest was a pathway for a whole bunch of different coyote packs. So they literally passed each other. So I would have, you know, I don't even know how many different packs. I mean packs, like probably eight to 15, 16 coyotes in one pack. And we had lynx and we had bobcats and, but we had bears and I was really scared of bears. And I guess it was because I'd never been around them. Yeah. And I had a, com a couple incidences with them when I didn't know that they were there and scared the living crap out of me. I mean, I loved them. I would never want to hurt them, but they really scared me. But when I opened up my ravine and we built this pond, the bears would come and swim in the pond. And I was able from a distance to really watch them and I watched them with their babies and the mamas would go in the pond and they would float backwards and the babies would learn how to swim and like jump on the mamas and the mamas would sink and, 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 you know, they were rolling around. I'm like, Oh my God, I feel like I'm watching like a Walt Disney movie. Right. Like, yeah. like, you know, like yeah. for real. But what happened was I was able to watch what really bears were. Like I was able to see what bears were like, like, like their, their, how, how family oriented they were and how they were fine with the deer. And they were, they were actually, they would, my friend, they would, I guess bears can get quite, bears and deer can get quite aggressive when they're mating season. And my friend had a whole bunch of horses up the road and the bear and the deers, they would go, they would leave their cubs or their fawns with the horses. And then they would go and mate and then they would come back later and pick up their babies because some of the babies would, it's just like, that's what I'm talking about. Like this, this, this synergy, if we just leave them alone, yeah, for sure yeah. things get eaten, like whatever, right. but watching them for real from a distance and not interfering, you know, not going, Oh my God, Oh my God. You know, there's a bear in between my horses. They're going to eat my horses. Um, and then you see, Oh my God. Right it's it's incredible like it's really incredible that's amazing but uh yeah and i just i find it i woke up this morning and i was like okay we're gonna be talking about spay and neuter today right it's like yeah, yeah. what a what a interesting topic to be well, talking about in this this at this time I, i'm so excited to have you on it i mean you're having me on, uh, but to talk about spay and neuter and early spay and neuter, especially because you know how much it's impacted me and Ali, Ali and I. And uh, I was talking to Dr. Karen Becker the other the other day for about 15 minutes, and I told her we were going to be speaking this morning, and she said after you and I talk, I should interview spayed women 
um, about how it's affecting their life and what they're doing environmentally and lifestyle and, and all that to kind of, um, you know, to help that. Um, so I don't, I, I didn't ask her. Women with hysterectomies and stuff, you mean? I get, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. I'm not really quite clear, but, um, you know, what am I going to, am I going to go around to random women and, and say, like, how am I going to find, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, that's a really, really, that's an interesting thing. Karen would say something like that. Um, and, and she's right, right? Because what, what's so cool about women having to have hysterect, like early hysterectomies and stuff, mm -hmm. is they're actually allowed, they can tell you how they felt. Yes. Right. Whereas an animal can't say, well, you know, I feel like this or I feel like right. that. But from an experience of, yeah, you know, after my hysterectomy, this is what happened to me and this is how I felt and this is what I'm doing as prevention or, you know, whether they're doing. And um, um, I, I think you're, you're right. I mean, women can tell you how they feel, but in dogs are such magnificent creatures, as you know, that we take their behavior as face value, that they're doing just fine or they're doing okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong until it turns into like in Allie's case, cellular dysfunction or metabolic dysfunction or, um, and then it's like uh, this palpable, notable disease, it's like something is clearly wrong and we've yeah. so missed the curve on it. And I feel like it's not even really a conversation right now. And that's why I wanted to have you on because of everything I've learned through this whole thing. Um, unfortunately, it took me, you know, seven or eight years to, to really get a grasp on it for her. Um, and I'm thankful that we kind of came out the other side, but those dogs that go their whole lives with and struggling and, and people don't even know, you know, what's wrong where they don't get that help. So that's why I wanted to bring you on to, to talk about this. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> um, and, and when I was like, it's an interesting time to talk about it because everybody's, you know, worried about destruction and death and disease and 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 then we're going to be talking about you know puppies and kittens and to do's and not to do's and what you know you know trying to find that trying to find that place of you know what's best what isn't best and it's funny i have these i love orchids and i'm going off track a little bit again but i love orchids and i have all of these orchids that I, you know every day i go out and i talk to them it's like are you ever gonna you know have new flowers and you know i like I give them once a week, I give them their ice cubes to try to make them have, you know, because they, all their flowers have died. Right. So I'm, I'm hoping that they're going to grow. And then this morning I went out, I brought it in here. It's like, all right, we're going to talk about puppies and kittens and spaying. And that's like life and babies. And it's, it's, it's such an awesome topic. It's a weird topic, maybe a little bit right now. And then I went out to my sun porch and which I do all the time. And I went out to the sun porch and my orchid, look it. Can you see it? Wow. I know. It's actually flowering. And I, so I had to bring it in just so I could show everybody. It's not anything like magnificent, but it's magnificent to me because it's I, it, what it made me do and is go, okay, like life, we're all isolated and we're all like in this like little cocoon kind of thing but life is really there's, it's still happening right like mm -hmm. flowers babies are being born puppies are being born kittens are being born horses are being born the the birds are flying around i went down to the barn and everybody's chirping so i think what i'm talking why well, i want to say this is i'm talking about I'm talking about spaying and neutering and we're going to be talking about life right and we're, we're, I just, I just, I guess I want everybody to hear that it's still, life is still happening around us, even though we're scared, right? Yep. Like it's, it's like nature right now is oblivious in a way of what we're going through. But then when we turn the, turn the thing around, and this was going to bring me into the spay and neuter thing, when we turn, when we turn that around, we're, the majority of the world is oblivious to, to nature. Do, do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> so even though when I say they're oblivious, I don't mean that they don't understand and they don't feel our energy right now because we're scared. And I know our cats and dogs and horses and everybody are, 
are trying to support us through this time. But what I'm saying is that nature has been going through life-threatening diseases for a very long time because of us, yes. right? Because of global warming, because of our ignorance of not being proactive, reacting instead of stepping back and deciding what's the best. They've been going through what we're all going through right now for a really long time. And we have been really ignoring it, right? Like we haven't been paying attention. So now it's our time to pay attention to what's going on with us, with this, with the pandemic. Um, but it's also our time to, I really think, pay attention to nature, right? Like what has nature been trying to teach us? And can we right now in this moment apply that to ourselves to get out of this? Because nature is continuing, right? Like it is, it is, it, it, it's continuing no matter how hard we're hitting it. I mean, it's, it's starting to really feel the effects of us, but, but I, I feel like it's really our time right now to think about that. And that brings me now into what we talk about, like spaying and neutering, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know you really wanted to talk about the early spay and neuter. You want to do that first or what do you want to do? Yeah. Why don't, yeah. Why don't we start with, uh, so I'll, I'll, you know, so both spaying and neutering for everyone listening, both, I'm sure you guys know what this is, but spaying and neutering, it removes all the sex hormones secreting tissues from a dog's body. And the problem is dogs need a certain level of circulating sex hormones in the right proportions for normal physiologic and biologic functioning throughout their life. And when the ovaries and testicles are removed from a still developing young puppy, like Allie when she was eight weeks old, it can affect, it can affect, not always, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, but it can affect everything in their body from their brain to their bones. And that's been proven. And ha it has this neurotic, they have this neurotic like hypothalamus adrenal pituitary access that gets permanently and negatively shifted like it did with her. But can some dogs, Julie, go their whole lives with no problems if they're, even if they're early spayed and neutered? Oh yeah, they can. I mean, I, I, early spay and neuter hasn't been happening that long, but I think it's, I think, I truly think it's rare. Mm -hmm. I think it's rare that, that, that they will. Um, I feel like, you know, that's like saying, you know, I know some, I mean, you know what, with me with like over vaccinations and all that stuff, but I've seen dogs vaccinated and eating dry, crappy kibble food living right. to 15 years of age. Right. <laughs> like, so I feel like just to, to say all dogs are going to get sick from that. I don't know. Or all cats or whatever. I don't, but I feel like, again, that's, so, that just like, a, that's a really black or white. Right. And I think spay and neutering in general is not black and white at, on any level. And there's, there is, I guess too, it's, I'm such a homeopath, right? Where, where I've been, you know, I've had seven years at university drummed into me that everything is individual, right? Every animal, every person, everything is a, is we have, we have this, um, uh, uh, global energetic connection for sure but how we manifest that and how we represent that is 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 very individual so with me personally and at my vet hospital what i did is i tried to look at every situation from a from a as much of an individual perspective as i possibly could so um when we talk about early spay and neuter you're right and I think, I think it came from a, I think it initially, just like vaccines, I feel like initially it came from a good place. Okay. It came from, it came from a place where we were seeing, you know, thousands of animals in kill shelters, right? So when you go, okay, all of these animals are being killed. They don't even have the chance of living till they're four or five or six or whatever. So we need to reduce the amount of animals in that are being um, being given up and abandoned. A good place, but I think it came from a place that was much 
much to um, broad spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. it, I don't think every, it went from, oh, okay, I'm okay. Um, it came from a place of trying to reduce the amount of animals that were in, that were in shelters. But when I look at that, I also look at why there is even why there are there even kill shelters? All right. Okay. So yeah, I think you know I think one of the fascinating things uh, for me when it comes to the spay and neuter debate is you know it's so controversial and it's very difficult to really have a conversation with somebody about it. it, it's like a two ended dagger, you know, in one hand, there's enough research to show that it can potentially shorten the lifespan of your pet. And it can increase the rate of cancers. And uh, because of course, you know, stripping a, a human of their sex hormones is going to have some major implications. You remove yeah. the ovaries of a woman, you castrate a man, there's going to be some long term effects. We have an overpopulation problem. We have to remedy that problem. Of course, we have to have one eye on it, like you say. Um, nobody wants on un one of puppies or we or filled shelters nobody um, so there has to be a better technique and we yeah. have to find a technique that can improve the current situation that we're in and the problem um, nobody but also nobody wants to go in knowing they can potentially increase the rate of cancer or decrease the lifespan of their pet you know um, knowing that you know that data it's just really hard to do that and why can't we just be like socially responsible and never contribute to unwanted pregnancies or filling shelters. Um, but what about being hormonally and endocrinolo endocrinologically, if I said that right, responsible to an animal you, you're entrusted uh, to care for for their whole life? You know, maximizing, we all want the dog, like Maggie, 30 years old, we all want our dogs to live mm -hmm. a long, long, long time. But, you know, when we're maximizing lifespan and health span, we have to factor in sex hormones. We do, and I think I think how I mean I have no idea how globally to do that, other than um, through education. The same way you know, in 1994, people thought I was insane saying to eat raw food, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then it slowly you know the education slowly moves through communities and things like this happen, and people become more socially responsible. Um, I think I think what makes me the saddest is the the um, I don't know. I mean, I want I was gonna try. I got so busy, but I was gonna try to see the the statistics for you about whether or not um, it actually has decreased the amount of animals in in shelters. I know for sure it's decreased. I have a a good friend that does. Um, goes to the Bahamas every year and does a massive uh, sort of feral spay and neuters, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that that's, that helps tremendously with the amount of um, uh, puppies that are, that are being born and just living on the streets and, and treated like, you know, treated like almost like, um, I was gonna say parasites, not parasites, but uh, like rats and things like that, right? Like they're poisoned because they get into garbages and stuff like that. So they actually put poisoning out for the dog. So do I feel like something like that, it's necessary? Yeah, I do feel like it's necessary in something like that because, you know, there's, there's a part of me when I was in India and stuff where I, where I see, or just, I was just in Cuba a couple months ago and, and you see animals that are, that are pregnant and having babies and, and, and I kind of watch them and I think, okay, like I really had a hard time, right? Like seeing them. But when I really took a closer look at them, you know, I really felt like a lot of them were genuinely happy. They were skinny and they were hot and they were pregnant and they were fighting and they were all that stuff. But, but I, they were more, they're just more wild, right? Like they're more, they're, they're not, um, uh, they're not, they look, they, they kind of look healthy, right? They're definitely emotionally healthy. They weren't scared. You know, they weren't, they weren't, I went to this one, we went to a wedding and I went, we went to this one um, resort 
and it was this massive, massive, massive uh, buffet that probably held about a thousand people, like an outdoor buffet where everyone from that particular resort went to eat. And there were hundreds of cats. And yeah. then they just let them walk around and go under the tables. And my table looked disgusting because I kept throwing food under it. And I had probably like 40 cats under my feet. <laughs> but I, it's, it's, it's that part of our not understanding, right? And wanting to make everything perfect and fit into the Western culture and the Western world. So short of, you know, what's happening in, in places like the Bahamas where animals aren't treated well, like they're, the horses are treated horrifically in Cuba. I had the hardest time with that than, than anything. But the dogs and the cats seem to be, they just seem to be wild, right? And it's the same, the same in India. They aren't really treated as, um, you know, like rats and things like that. But we're in the Bahamas, which is, which now is much more Americanized. They're being, they're being poisoned and stuff. So even, even in countries, we have to look at it from a different perspective and stand back. And how do you do that? Like, I have no idea how to do that. I don't like, it, it's such a massive thing. So the only thing that I can feel like I can do from me and my perspective is try and educate um, people individually and through groups like this and through awareness. Because if you're sitting and watching this live or you're reading Karen, Dr. Becker's blogs or you're talking to holistic vets or you're, 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 you're educating yourself through people like you, whatever you're doing, then you're obviously a more conscious um, pet parent, right? Like you're, you're, you are ready. You are more conscious. You're not, you're not going to be the person that's going to just let their dog go out and get pregnant. No. Right. Or, or let your dog go out and get beat up on if it still has its testicles or become aggressive if it still has its testicles, because owning an, uh, uh, having a pet that's, that is still intact comes with more responsibility. That's right. the problem. So then you're weighing out that those odds, right? Because for me, what I would always say from a from a perspective of of males, right, is that for me, freedom is the freedom is ultimately one of the most important things in health for me. Yes, like more almost more important than food, almost more important than vaccines is their ability to be part of the pack your pack, which means to go where you're going, go for car rides, go to dog parks, go for walks, that, that freedom, right? I know a lot of people that keep their animals intact and then, then they live in the house. Allie is always, anywhere I go, she follows, if I'm not at work, anywhere I go, whether it's just to the, down the street to the store, she's off leash, she's trained, you know, and she, yeah. you know, she, I, I trust her off leash that she's not going to run into the street after a ball or a squirrel. She has that want to, but yeah. she has some impulse control there and I can trust her. And but when you don't, ha when you have something that's not spayed or neutered, it, yeah. add it adds another element to that, right? It adds another, it adds another responsibility to that yeah. because a lot of times what you see with male dogs, um, at least from my, from at my hospital, um, am I okay? Can you still hear me? Yep. Perfect. So what happens is that sometimes the male dogs are completely sweet and lovely, but, uh, neutered males will attack them, right? Because they smell different. They're, pro they're producing hormones that they can smell and, and they, they're producing, um, uh, they, they're, they're not normal. Like they're not something that they would normally fully be around right so there's lots of different uh things that are going off that i've heard tons of times that that and seen tons of times that unneutered males will get attacked by neutered males it's a, it's a pretty common occurrence right so or the opposite you know they aren't they're they're a individual that is intact that doesn't do well with suppressed sexual desire right right? So they get heightened. They get in heightened states. 
they'll get out with a bunch of dogs, you know, they'll smell something, something will happen and, and, and they're not, they're not getting enough exercise. So they get these repressed, suppressed emotions and then they can get aggressive. So again, it is just way more responsibility to have an intact animal. But if you're willing to take that and not wind up with a dog that can't go anywhere because it's aggressive, or, oh, she's in heat, so for a month she has to live in the backyard or in the house, you know, because we don't want her to get pregnant. Or, you know, like, like we, we really got to look at all of that. But, but that is more like conscientious spaying or, you know, uh, ovary sparing space where they continue to have their ovaries so that they can continue to have some sex hormones. Right. There's lots of different ways that we can look at that, but that and being conscious when you're spaying them, like wait till they're over a year or wait till they're over a year before you neuter them so that at least their, their growth plates and their knees are, are, are formed and, and, and things like that. Right. But when we're talking about really young spays and neuters like before eight weeks I really wanted to try and do my homework which I wasn't able to because I'm I was just so busy but I don't know long term if we're actually reducing the amount of animals in in North America that are eventually given up right or early deaths so death is a death right if 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 they're if they're if we have too many animals and they're going into a into a shelter and they're being euthanized when they're three years old or two years old or or you know puppy mills and things like that, um, we have one situation where they're 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 a lot of them are being euthanized, but how many are being given up to shelters because they have skin disease and people can't afford it anymore and they're only two and a half years old right and put in shelters and they're not killed shelters, but no one wants to adopt them because they have horrific skin disease or they've, or they've got diabetes or they've got some kind of medical situation that they aren't adopt. They, they can't get adopted out. So they're fostered out and they're right. like, like, it's not, it's not, um, I don't think we're looking at that because I, there, there is no doubt that not just what what Allie's going through now. How old is Allie now? She just turned eleven in February. Okay. I'm talking young. Okay, I'm talking seeing cancers and skin disease and and chronic diseases in well, animals at two years of age. Let's backtrack, a, a, go back to the aggression real quick. I know you, you said something really important that intact, they can be a bit more aggressive, right? If I'm correct, when they're intact. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, not all the time, um, but you know, there, I was looking at a study the other day from, and it's older, from the National Animal Interest Alliance. And it's, it's, it's titled, um, let me see here. So it's spayed females can be more aggressive than intact females. And contrary to popular belief, neutering males is not an effective treatment for aggressive behavior and may no. exacerbate other behavior problems. Yep. When, when Allie was, was, uh, was young, she, she was very, not, a, not truly aggressive, but very reactive to mm -hmm. other dogs, joggers. She's had, she has multiple bites on her record. Uh, little kid, little, little kids, bikers, joggers, bitten me many times. She was just a very neurotic, uh, a lot of noise phobia, thunderstorm, separate, severe separation anxiety. I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, and she was speed eight weeks. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of that can be sex hormones, right? Can be, can be dopamine, can be where you're like your hormones are like a waterfall right so mm -hmm. it, it it's really hard to know unless you can actually do a hormone panel so progesterone is the hormone that has that gives you confidence yes right so when there's not enough progesterone then then with some animals with people that will relate in different ways, right? Like feeling 
feeling not confident, you could be a fear biter, you could be hyper reactive, you could be aggressive in ways where it's because the, the aggression is coming from fear, not because they're aggressive, right? So it's really hard to get in their heads. It's really hard to understand what's going on. And this is why I keep saying like, like hormones are one thing, but you know, how they're raised, what happens to them, their, their breed, like, you know, even in vitro, you know, animals that are, that are, are in, that have been raised or born into puppy mills where there's a lot, a lot, a lot of stress. Those puppies are born in a vulnerable position emotionally, right? So, you know, your microbiome has a massive, massive contribution to your hormones. Your microbiome has a massive contribution to the way they're, they're, they're thinking and feeling. So when you, when you look at the accumulative effect of all of it, right? No hormones, crappy microbiome, stress, because if they're eight, anybody that's, that's neutering them at, at eight weeks of age, chances Pro are- Processed food. Right, and pro I mean the whole, yeah. It's, it's, it's surprising that animals are as healthy. I always say that. It blows me away that dogs and cats are as healthy as they are. But getting back to where I, you know, I kind of started Adored Beast from, was that 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 where it blew me away that more animals were you elected euthanasia with skin disease than anything else more than cancer more than anything elected skin disease was the number one reason for death through elected euthanasia because they get it at such a young age it's a terrible disease to watch they have crappy quality of life you know they go through drugs after drugs people can't afford it anymore and mm -hmm. then they either euthanize them or they give them up a lot like i was shocked when i first heard that so that's why i'm saying like are we really like i don't i don't know like this push button thing where oh you you vaccinate or you neuter them at 8 weeks what how many of those animals are winding going up going back and being given up or or euthanized because they're sick. How many, how much money are we putting into vet bills with chronically ill animals that could be going into creating a better situation of dealing with, with um, the, the overpopulation of dogs and cats, right? Like the trap and release things, right? Where, where I, I worked very closely with an incredible um, uh, re cat rescue in Vancouver called Vancouver Orphan Kitten Rescue. And, you know, part of them, they had the feral traps and trap and release. I mean, we know that that really helps is, is by spaying and neutering the mothers and the, the wild ones, right? Like the, the adults, and then putting them back out into their, the, into their colonies. I, it is very political because I feel like going, how come everybody and their brother is allowed to breed dogs and cats? Like, why is that happening? Why is that even allowed? You know, like it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough, tough, tough talk because it, it is, it's such a larger picture, which is, I look at spay and neutering going, this is such a typical thing of our society. Because no one's no one is actually looking at what's the situation, right? Why don't people have to be licensed to breed dogs? Right, I and totally what, and, agree. And what is that? What would that license entail? You know, like what would that license like? What who? But then you're like, okay, well, who's in charge of the licensing? You know, like is it going to mean that oh, you're a breeder, so you absolutely have to vaccinate? Da, da 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 you have to feed this kind of food da, da, it, it could get it could get out of total depends on who I, I wish it were you I wish it were you that were you know coming up with that uh, program that would be amazing yeah I mean I think I think there's there once I was on the midwife task force to get midwifery um, accepted as a as a as a medical modality right this is a long time ago. And, and 
it's like strength in numbers. So the more education that we have about the side effects of early spay and neuters, which there is tons out, out there, what we, what we don't want to do is go never, 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 never early spay and neuter. Because then we're just as equally as bad as everybody has to early spay and neuter. Yes. We have to come from a place of really, really, really looking at this and educated people being on boards and a wide array of people being on a board in order to, um, you know, look at it, look at it as a, as, as states or or provinces or countries or you know what I mean? Like it's it's a massive thing to to look at. So so I think that I think that the 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 what I want to say is early spay and neuter is absolutely in my opinion contraindicated. I don't I don't I don't believe that we are creating a better um outcome a what but i don't for me it's like and this sounds maybe sounds really harsh but i feel almost like for me it's more important for them to live a healthy vibrant life and live less i know that sounds terrible than live a life of chronic disease and wearing a cone around their head their whole lives or constantly back in and out of the vet clinic or, or sick, or, you know, do you know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, absolutely. So, absolutely. So when I look at early spay and neuters, I feel like it's incredibly detrimental. I feel like it, 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 it sets animals up for a long-term chronic care, chronic disease, chronic care. It stresses out families, the family dynamic, the, the human animal bond family dynamic becomes com com becomes completely shifted as you know when you get a puppy or a kitten that has a chronic disease from a very young age it puts huge financial stress on on families i i counsel i used to have to counsel families on how to deal with it you know, one person would want to euthanize them or give them away or they couldn't afford it. Somebody else would, like the families would be fighting over it. You know, oh my God, the kids are giving them this and they're allergic to that. It, like it's intense. It's intense living with a sick animal for a long, long time. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tough call. It's very, I mean, that is a, such a huge topic on its own, like living with a sick animal and one with a hormone imbalance, like you know, I'm probably doing a lot more than the typical person would do or could do. Um, I live pretty frugally to be able to afford a lot of the things that I do for Allie. Like after we get off the phone here, I'm heading to Dr. Roman's clinic in Hopkinton to pick up a couple bags of her dog's microbiome. And it sits in my fridge and every day Allie gets a little tiny almond sized piece of her dog's of healthy donor poop. And yeah. because, you know, we started out, her life started out antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic for diarrhea. Now, if she gets diarrhea, I feed her a bland diet or I fast her or, you know, like I do, I just don't eat. I just feel better eventually. And, but, um, you know, I, like, it's one of the things it, it's, I spend so much money on her and I have no problem with it. I love it. Like, you know, I would do anything for her and she'd do but the same for me. But right the stress the stress of like oh my god how am i going to do this for the rest of her life um you know i would really love to go out to dinner this this week but i can't <laughs> you know um things like that because i'm a i'm a teacher and we we live a lot of us live paycheck to paycheck like a lot of you guys do and especially now with this challenging time we're in i've definitely stressed about how am i going to get her what she needs vet clinic vet, a lot of vet clinics are uh closing down a little bit um, and it's just very worrisome, but, you know, trying to find, uh, like, it's just not a one size fits all approach and every dog that has a hormone imbalance is not going to have the same treatment plan. Um, I use a lot of your products too, Julie. I want to show a couple really quick. Um, I use jump for joints, you know, quite often and, you know, dogs that have been early spayed or neutered, 
can have musculoskeletal issues, right? And joint, joint issues. So yeah. almost every one of your products on your page can help a dog with issues that go back to early spay and neuter. You know, like phytosynergy, I just started using this. Um, I love it. And uh, Allie has a lot of cellular, I, I invest a lot of money into her cellular health. I yeah. did a, I did a, a test uh, in probably three or four months ago on her genetic age, and it was seven. And she's 11 chronologically. And I, I love that. I'm really interested in that. I, the last two articles you wrote for Dogs Naturally Magazine on cellular health were amazing, amazing. And I've, um, you know, so I also do a, a lot of ozone therapy. Uh, she drinks, we both drink ozonated water. <laughs> As dogs age, I want her to die well. I want her to age well and almost not go like this but more like a very slow, gradual, like where she's thriving until she just passes. You know, there's, there's two ways of looking at that when we're talking about passing, but um, let's talk about, let's remind me to, to talk about that for two minutes. Well, I'll just do it now, but remind me later to tell you sort of what I would do in this time. Not, I'm not talking about like the Corona time, but I'm talking about you know, until we can get things, bylaws changed until like, what, what can we do? And what would I recommend if you get a puppy, you know, mm -hmm. would you, would you, would I keep them intact? Wouldn't I keep them intact? But what you said right now is, it was, is interesting. Like you want her to go like this, right? So there's two ways, there's two ways of looking at that. Cause you're living with a dog with chronic disease, right? And, yeah. and what I would find in my clinic is that sometimes um, my, my, one of my professors, Sue Armstrong in England, um, she's a vet in England and, and she always would say, I want, I want my life and my, ana my patient's life to go up like a plane, fly along, couple turbulence here and there, keep flying, and then a fast decline, right? Because um, when you're really healthy, your death should be, uh, I, I, it's hard to say this, but quick and easy, almost. Right. right? Like you, your body should be able to maintain its homeostasis until it can't anymore, right? And then your exit should be sort of, not should be, there's no such thing, but would be nice to be sort of quick and easy not long and drawn out, but what you're, I think, dealing with Allie, and that brings us right back to the spay and neuter, is you've been dealing with Allie with chronic disease from the get-go. Yes. Right? So, you, so you've never found that easy takeoff, let's let fly, have a couple bumps here and there, and then, and then right. decline. But a healthy body, that is, that is, that is essentially how it, how it, how it would be ideally be, right? It's not, but we don't see that with dogs and cats anymore. We see that a lot with, I saw that as a kid, right? Yeah. I saw that as a kid with our farm animals. Right. They, we never did anything with them. If they broke their leg, the vet would come and fix their leg. Like our farm vet sometimes would even come and take a, take a look at them, mm -hmm. but they lived a long time and they, my cats would often get, run over by tractors because they were blind and they'd be out when they were 25 years old mousing they'd die that way or they would or all of a sudden you know oh they're not eating oh they're dead you know a week later like you know but they're old they're 14 16 when they're dogs they're 25 20 25 when they're cats so so we don't see that is what i'm sort of saying we're not, we don't, we don't see, we haven't in the last maybe, you know, 20 years really been, been able to observe that with our animals because we do so much intervention. Like I said, we're, I'm surprised half of them are even alive. We're spaying them, we're neutering them, we're va over vaccinating them, we're feeding them crappy food, we're putting toxic chemicals on them, they're locked in houses, they don't have enough space and exercise, like how they even are surviving period is incredible. 
you know, I, I think you, you come from a, I mean, you, you have a conventional background. You were in, you were, you were in, you were doing that at, early on. And I know that you were seeing a lot of, you were seeing a lot of death and your family did an intervention with you. And for those listening from my group or even on Julie's page, you can go back into my group and I'll post the links after this is over of our previous uh, two lives where Julie talks about this uh, in her, in her history. But you know, so many of us are used to just reaching for what's comfortable. Oh, our dog ran up the steps and sprained her leg. Uh, I'm going to call my vet and get, um, you know, tramadol or whatever the pain pill is. And I'm just going to give her this. Um, we need to be expanding our, you know, knowledge and our, uh, in, in watching events like we're doing now on dogs naturally and as much as we can and be reaching for the arnica in our cabinet first. Um, and doing, I think that's going to be how we get that, that uh, perfect death. That I'm going to be doing like, we're doing a lot of stuff to our website too. So I'm going to be doing, um, even in this time right now, you know how I used to do a lot of, it's, it's called ask me anything. And it would always be like, you know, there would still be, um, I know Stephanie would, was the one that was always navigating that with me with dogs naturally. And we'd be finished and we'd still have 120 questions <laughs> that people yeah. still wanted to ask. So yeah. what I'm going to do in this next, while everybody's sort of cooped up and I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, people can ask me about coronavirus or whatever they want, but I'm also trying to help make, in this time when we can't get out and we can't work now's the time to for us to get really educated right like to educate mm -hmm. ourselves even more so i'm going to be doing just free ask me anything on mm -hmm. our, on our facebook and stuff like that where people can just call in and and or call in type in questions and then and, and we can have tea and hang out and as an example just quickly i'm just going to tell you about della uh, I decided when I, when I got Della, I decided that I wasn't going to spay her. She was um, four months old. She was a Great Dane English Mastiff cross. And I knew 100% I wasn't going to spay her because of the incidence of osteosarcoma in large breed dogs, I think is 80% higher. It's, it's, it's vastly, vastly higher. In, in, Very in, scary. In altered, altered large breed dogs. So I... Um, decided there was no way I was going to spay her and and I didn't and I was super careful with her she was on raw food she wasn't vaccinated she was she was a specimen at nine years of nine years old she could jump over a four foot fence because she was she was raised with smaller dogs she was raised with like blue healers and Italian greyhounds and stuff she didn't, she didn't think she was big she thought she was one of them Oh yeah. She was insane. She was just incredible. Like I, I, my bed is like princess in the pea. Like you have to, it's like three and a half feet high and she would just like jump up on my bed and no problem. And, um, you know, I was always really careful with her and, and she was such a mama that I had to be pay really a, like close attention to her because she would get false pregnancies and things when she would have her heats. Mm -hmm. And I'd also have to be careful, you know, that she, when we, when we walked, cause I was living in Vancouver at the time, um, you know, when she was in heat, she wore diapers and whatever. But, um, I moved out here to Nova Scotia and I got a puppy and I rescued him and I decided that I wasn't going to, you know, I live on this massive farm. I decided I wasn't going to neuter him. And so I didn't, but it was a nightmare when they, when she would come in heat right? Like he was just, even as a baby, he was just like all over her and we had to keep them separated. And it was really stressful and the whole nine yards. But what happened was when she was, I don't even remember how old she was now. Anyway, she wound up getting Pine Mitra. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. So she wound up getting Pine and I was always really careful and I had just moved here and I didn't have a, a close connection with any of the vet hospitals here. And I knew instantly that she had pine mitra. How did you know? What signs? Because that's always in my mind. I have a friend with a, a, an intact female Brittany Spaniel. And, you know, he's not going to get her spayed. But how do you, what signs do you look for with pine mitra? Well, post, post heat, right? 
you have to be just really careful. Like Della used a nest. So she would, she thought she was pregnant. She looked like she would, was good. Actually, she would, one time she got milk. She got like a pseudo pregnancy and actually got milk. And um, so you, you need to watch them. And if you see any kind of discharge, like a greeny white discharge or a, or a yellowish discharge at all, a vol, a vol from, her, from their vulva, um, lethargy, drinking more, going off their food, um, either getting really clingy or wanting to be alone, anything that's off, because it's it's really life threatening. They can they, a close by nature, they can die quite quickly. Yeah. So we have to be really aware of that and and careful with that. And there are different remedies that you can use, like homeopathic remedies, to try and to try and um, and try and deal with that, because it happens more. I believe it happens more with animals that really want to have babies where where because then what happens is that after a certain amount of time they they um if they're bred then they're it, everything closes in order to contain a safe environment for the fetus to grow mm -hmm. so if it closes and they're not pregnant then all of that discharge and not everything that's supposed to be leaving their body stays and then the progesterone and all the hormones start to increase as if they're pregnant and then it becomes this this perfect home for a storm of pyometra right of pus and infection and the list goes on and on so for animals that do tend to i always say for animals that do tend to get um uh nasty after you have to be more careful and then prior to the next time that they come in heat or as soon as they do come in heat remedies like giving them remedies where you can see that they that they want to have that they're like oh i wish i was getting pregnant you can give them pulsatilla you can give them ignasia you can give them nat mirror to try and and help them slip through that without the emotional attachment of them really hoping that they're pregnant if that makes sense mm -hmm. i i actually find that proactively it, it really helps you can yeah. also give them herbs to keep the the uterus contracting and stuff to get rid of discharge and things everything you're saying right now comes along with being responsible if you're going to keep your dog intact that's what that's i'm talking about really important to know to know the signs to always have it in the back of your head yeah. Um, you know, I, like my, for example, my friend doesn't know what to look for. So I'm going to show him this. Um, yeah. And you can also tell him I've got a, I'm going to have fairly soon, like they can at adoredbeast.com. I'm, I'm going to be having, um, uh, all my blogs up in, in, in courses about, about, you know, what do you do with pyometra? How do you, how do you recognize pyometra? All of that stuff's going to be free on our, on our, on our website. How do you feel about, I know we talked about breeders a little bit, a little bit ago, but how do you feel about naturally rearing breeders for the benefit of the breed? Um, because there are breeders that backyard breeders and ones that shouldn't be breeding animals and, and they're, they're the, you know, a big problem. Uh, they're breeding unhealthy animals or feeding them processed foods or over vaccinating them and early spay and neuter. Um, what about the ones that are trying to do it right to, keep to, to kind of you, do you know what i'm trying to say the naturally rearing i do, I do but let me just finish with Della. Sure. So Della had to go in and get spayed because she she had pyometra yes. and this was a dog that could stand in a in a 160 pound dog that could stand and jump up on my bed you know as a geriatric large breed dog two and a half weeks after she had her her spay I had to pick her up and put her on my bed. That's how, that's how fast she aged. Wow. After, after removing her, I mean, she had, a, she had a surgery and she was compromised and all that kind of stuff, but her, her muzzle went gray. She didn't have any gray. Her muzzle went gray within a month. She, she, she drastically aged and like literally in front of my eyes. That's insane. And, um, uh, what I wanted to say is like you've been working with Andrea, right? My colleague Andrea. Yep. That, 
a big one. So what I did want to say is for people that are in a situation right now where they've, they've fallen, I mean, these puppies that are spayed and neutered at eight weeks old, they have to get, they have to, in cats and stuff, they have to get homes too. You know, yeah. we can't, we can't not go out and get them because not go out and buy them because, or, 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 or adopt them or whatever, just because we are scared because they've been spayed and neutered. Cause there's a ton of them. Right? right. I just don't think we should be supporting breeders to, to do that. We have to start saying, no, I want to, I want a puppy from you, but I don't want it spayed and neutered first or whatever. Like start, start, start requesting that. Right. But mm -hmm. for ones that are or ones that you just can't, you can't prevent it. Um, my Andrea has that, and maybe you can post that. Um, she's got my spade. Like I used to have that. Right. And then the FDA stopped us from bringing it over. Are these the this is what you're talking the spay and neuter remedies? Yes. Yep. And yeah. Andrea Andrea sent them to me in these little envelopes with instructions. And yeah. this one's for Allie. I give her once a month. And this one's for my parents' dog Shadow, who's neutered. I just got this because I wanted to. I want. He's only two, but I want to prevent what happened to Allie because my yeah. parents certainly don't have the. They're not going to put in the the financial investment that I have into Allie. So. I want to try. That's a very inexpensive. Can you talk about what these are? Yeah, for sure. And and you know, you're going to have a lot of people go, well, homeopathy isn't pro isn't you can't do prevention with with homeopathy. And I and in this case, I would have to say I I disagree cuz and I can say that because I've used it. I used it at my clinic for almost 20 years and I did see the difference with the animals that were on that and not on that. Um uh, what it actually is, is everyone knows like homeopathy is like cures like. So you're using, uh, you actually use the, you take the, the remedy that would create the same symptoms in order for your body to respond. So those remedies are literally, um, you would have the, the canine ovaries yep. and then the, the male one would be canine testes. So they're remedies made from that. Um, and the feline one is the same, only as for, they're only as cats yep. and people freak out and they go, Oh my God. Like, so are you, you know, is this, is there, are animals being spayed and neutered in order to make this? What's so cool is that the remedies that these are made from are such old remedies that they're from animals that were probably never vaccinated and from years and years and years and years ago. Mm -hmm. So you're just, it's, it's like you're giving homeopathic um, uh, bioidentical hormones almost, right? Only they're homeopathic. And I have seen, and how I know that they do work is because I've taken people, people have gone, well, I don't think they need it anymore. I don't think, I don't think my animal needs it. Like in my clinic, right? For the rest of them. They would take them off a bit and then all of a sudden things would, would, would sneak in. And what I realized is that they don't need a lot. The body just needs to remember. So it's not like giving an, it's not like giving a, an herb or a supplement. It's a homeopathic remedy that just reminds the body of what it's supposed to do. Right. Yep. So, so it is, it's, it's, I find it incredible for, for support with, especially early spay and neuters. Yeah. Really, really important. Yeah. Once a month I give Ali and shadow, uh, once a month and I have it in my calendar, it pops up an alarm every, it's on repeat every month. Uh, it's three doses, 20 to 30, 20 to 30 little pellets on the, along the gums or, uh, for three doses spaced eight hours apart. It's really easy. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. super easy. And, and that bottle is going to last me years. And it was know, it's so inexpensive. Like yeah, it's great. And Karen's got um Karen's got a hormone uh Karen Becker's got a, a hormone um uh powder, right? Yeah. For 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 dogs and cats. Yep. So that's that's all that's that's like an added thing too, right? They're very different. One's a homeopathics and one's a one is yep. a, a glandular and a supplement. Yep. So, you know, doing your best, don't don't just leave these poor little creatures there because they have spayed and neutered. Get right. them. And start right away, you know, supporting them. At the same time, we're trying, like, try. Everybody needs to try and educate, and and at the same time, build that that community support in order to try and really logically 
look at the situation of spay and neuters, look at the situations of kill shelters, look at the situations of of pets out there, look at the situations of who should be breeding and who shouldn't be breeding. I know natural rearing. Um, uh, I have a mixed bag about that because, you know, like I said, I grew up on a rescue. So I had so many dogs around me all the time. Yeah. Um, I feel like, I feel like I, I, there's part of me that feels like it's important to maintain our old breeds, right? Like our original old breeds. I do. And make sure that they're that you know that they're not you know inbreeding and and breeding for structure to make their heads look skinnier because Designer that's the, dogs. Right, yeah right now like it is it's so I get so upset about that stuff that it's hard then for me to go yes I think that we should be breeding dogs mm -hmm. right it's like no we should, be, we should be adopting dogs that need homes that are in shelters and rescuing dogs and and things like that that's 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 my nature. So, and and I, I totally agree with that. But how how do so for example, when leading up to this live that you and I are doing now, leading up to it, I've reached I've reached out to local shelters, local rescues, even ones in neighboring states, and to get them to join us today uh, from an educational standpoint. And I was met with such a hard wall that and it was done respectfully it was done out of love for the animals and for continuing education but you know there was just like no there was no right. talking so, about it so so what we have to be really really careful of is that i don't think that peace comes until you have strength in numbers right so it was like, I always keep going back to the midwife stuff and you have to kind of have all your ducks in the row. You have to have all your statistics. You have to come from a real place of, um, from science, from, you know, number, not numbers of people supporting that too, for sure. But like, yes, in California, this is how many animals, you know, died 10 years ago before this in kill shelters. This is how many animals that are being euthanized at three years of age from chronic disease. This is how much, like, you can't just go, hey, do you want to watch this? I mean, you can, you can do whatever you want, but you will continue to be met with resistance because growing up in, in a rescue, right, uh, and, and treating a lot of rescues, I mean, I, I did thousands and thousands and thousands of animals at my, it's like pro bono at my clinic over, the, over 20 years. I don't even... I can't even remember, like probably 20,000 animals. Um, so I've been, I've been deep in rescue for my whole life. So I, um, I know that they can be the most amazing people in the world and they can also be the most closed minded people in the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, from my heart, the reason I'm saying that is because they see hell. Right? Yeah. They, they see things that, you know, growing up with me and working with my mom and stuff, I saw things that I actually can't even talk to people about yeah. because they can't even listen. They, they just go like, I, you know, no, I don't, I can't hear Mama, it. In PTSD. It's, it, it, it is the, some of the worst thing, like worst things I've ever seen in my whole life. Right. So when, when rescues do get harsh with people, a lot of it comes from love, but then all, then all of a sudden it all of a sudden shifts can, can, shift where they're not seeing the forest for the trees right and i think it's because they just they they aren't thinking outside the box at all because they've seen so much horrible stuff yeah. so i think to the way to make a change with this is to you know create groups of people that will donate time to collect surveys and find data and get information and then whiteboard and 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 think futuristically of, of, you know, how are we going to do this in one state and maybe not another state, like individual states, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than in, in provinces and stuff, rather than it being a mass blanket statement for, is for any, everybody. Is anyone doing this? Do you know anyone that's, that's tech? I don't. Maybe we should talk about that. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a ton of work, and I think that's why no one's done it because they think. And also, 
to be honest, I mean, we can see now, right? Like it hasn't been a mandate for a while, right? So it's, it's not something that's been going on for 20 years that we can go, oh yeah, we can collect lots of data. So we can, we would have to look at, we'd have to look at that part of it, like how we would actually do that. Do you think it's going to be an even bigger challenge than, than change, like in Delaware, the rabies law, now, now it's, you can do titers. It's not yeah. required. So, and that, they're the first state. It's this, we, it's taken all this time for us, to, for us to get there. And it came, it was born out of tragedy. One guy determined to change the law in his state because he had a dog, had a reaction and passed away. Um, and but what do you think about the Spain, like what we just talked about, the spay neuter changing that? Do you think it's going to be an even bigger hurdle than the rabies issue? Um, I, I it might be as big of a hurdle, but it'll be a different hurdle yeah. because we're not the rabies. The challenge with the rabies thing is because rabies is zoonotic. So the government can step in because it is considered a, um, a, a public health issue, right? Okay. Which is very different, right? They're saying, we're going to tell you what to do because we can, because if a dog gets rabies or if a cat gets rabies, they can affect a person. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, a, it's a different law. We're dealing with bylaws with spays and neuters, not, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different, it's a very different thing. So I don't know whether it'll be, it'll be a challenge. It'll be a, a, a massive challenge. I think the biggest challenge is going to actually just be data. I think once you actually could prove something and get data, most political parties are going to be able to look at something and go, oh my God really so yeah we've saved all these animals from being going into shelters but our incidence of chronic disease and our incidence of animals being um uh, given up to shelters or euthanized is exponentially bigger right so it's i think it's all about proof and data and statistics really can you talk about a st um a case when you had your clinic of uh, of chronic disease or early spay and neuter that you knew was from this was like maybe the start of it that kind of made the animal unravel um, and then the, a successful case where you treated them maybe with the remedy or like what did you see like what was the outcome well for me it's almost a um, it's not even a case it's like cases cases yeah, and cases where where they just they just, you know, they start getting, they start getting, um, you know, sometimes it's failure to thrive. Sometimes it's, you know, they just, they just aren't, you know, they're getting early ear infections or ear infections really young, or they're getting, um, you know, pa uh, puppy vagina uh, vaginitis or, or something where they, you know, some puppies would get it in general, but they would get over it faster. Do you know what I mean? They would, they would come through it faster. It was really easy and clear to see that the puppies that came in or the kittens that came in that were that were spayed and neutered at that age, when they had an issue, they didn't recover the same way, right? And they had they had a lot of um, almost like you know what you were saying with your dog, like interesting symptoms, like symptoms like why would they be getting this when they're this young? right? And you do blood work on them and stuff and they seem normal, but they're not normal, right? They're, they're, they wax and wane. Like you get calls, oh, he's really lethargic today. He's not eating today. Okay. Bring him in. His temperature is normal. His blood work is normal. His stool samples, normal. everything's normal, but the dog is clearly not normal, <laughs> right? Because, because they can compensate so, 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 so well. Yeah. They compensate, they can compensate when they're not vital, for so well, and then all of a sudden, it oh. they crash. Some crash crash earlier, some crash later. That will depend on their lifestyle, their amount of exercise they're getting, the kind of food they're getting, whether they're over vaccinated, whether. So animals that are early spayed and neutered, we have to be way, way, way more cognizant and, and aware of everything else that's help happening to them, right? Because they're going to be more vulnerable. It's right. just that's have so, you ever? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Pardon? I was going to say, have you ever 
uh, have you ever fixed an animal or helped an animal that had a oh, issue on, on kibble? Oh, on kibble. Have I fixed it? Have I actually been able to help animals that have been on kibble? With a, with a hormone imbalance, have you ever been able to instill change in them with if they're eating kibble? That's a hard call because I never, you know, until there were really, really early spay, lots of early spays and neuters, or until I looked at something and went, this is chronic disease. And w how I started spay and neuter protocol that you have in your hand yep. was when I would be given, doing everything right. They were not being over vaccinated. They were not, they were all on raw food diets. People they had great lifestyles, but they, they continued to either relapse, right? They continued to relapse or they just didn't, they didn't thrive like I would expect them to. That's when I was like, okay, you know, I started re reading a lot. This was like 20 years ago. I really started reading, you know, cause, and this wouldn't have been obviously early, early spay and neuters. These dogs probably would have been spayed or neutered when they were six months. So I started incorporating the spay and neuter protocol and it, it was incredible how much, how much better they, they responded and how they were able to balance out and how they were, they started thriving. But they, that was a combination of everything, right? Like diet, food or diet, you know, being careful of, of the amounts of vaccinations and flea products and, and right. the stress levels were good. But your question about whether or not I was able to help an animal that had hormone imbalance plus on dry food, um, that's a, that's a hard call because I can honestly say 99.9% .9 of all my patients were on raw food diets or, mm -hmm. or a combination of raw right. food diet, like soaking kibble with bone broth and mm -hmm. then adding raw food to it or cooked food to it or real food to it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I honestly don't believe I had any long-term clients that kept their animals on what? dry food. What? What about microchipping? How could that have an effect on the body and the hormones? Because Allie's microchipped, and I know it's 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 pretty standard, tr tr you know. But um, can that affect the body on a cellular level and hormones and all that? I think how how microchip effect, chips affect the body is that the body stays in a state of hyper vigilance because they know that there's something there that is um foreign. So it's almost like, like they're aware of keeping something contained, right? In an area that th there's just no doubt that they know that it's there, right? But I'm not saying cognitively, right? The body's the body. The, body, the body knows that there is something that's implanted that is not supposed to be there. Right. And, and when we, like I got to, you know, what I try to do is back everybody up and the same thing applies, right? It's like, it's like, where do you live? Where do your dogs go? Are they loose on their own? Like you've got to weigh out your odds, right? Of, of, you know, is it, is it something that is, you know, going to save your dog from going to a shelter that you'll never, ever find them again? You know, like what, you know, does your dog ever, you know, leave your sight? Does it, you know, I, I think, I think we really have to look at, again, individual, individual circumstances of, of what happens. I mean, hi, Henry. Before um, we used to tattoo them, you know, they used yeah. to their ears or their flanks or, or whatever. Um, there's, there's stuff with that as well. You know, is it, is it as severe, you know, I can don't you, know. Can you remove a microchip once it's already implanted at a young age? Can you, can you. I think is, you can, but I think it's hard. It's hard. I think it's so an alternative to, so we did, we talked about steriliza sterilization a little bit. When I type in spay and neuter on Facebook or Google or just 
in search engine in general, it's almost like politics. You see all these propaganda and posters and don't delay the spay or delay, uh, you know, and uh, like $5 spay and neuter low cost clinic. Will there ever be a low cost sterilization clinic where they do ovary sparing spays low cost? Why is why is why is sterilization so much more expensive than the traditional spay and can that will that ever change because some people when they're faced with the decision they go with the spay and neuter because they it's too much money well not just too much money there's also a lot of vets that aren't taught aren't doing it aren't doing it yeah well they it's not that they're not doing it they don't know how to do it and it's a simpler so, isn't it simpler Mm, it no. might be easy. It's easier, but it's not necessarily simpler, like the procedure. Uh, when you'll start seeing that is when they start teaching it at school. I hope that's soon. Right. They'll have to, they have to, they're going to have to start teaching that at school in order for it to be a mainstream procedure. Right. And then, and then maybe, maybe we will start it's to see that. Way. But again, mm -hmm. that's public demand, right? Like, yeah clinics and doctors and hospitals and whatever will respond to public demand, especially the vet association, because it's still, it's not covered under our medical, right? Like people have to pay for their, for their stuff. So in a way it's, it's this weird situation where we're, where they're clients and customers, right? right. They're, they're, there's a little bit of both. So I, I, I think that, you know, I mean, like now there's a lot more hospitals if you had asked me 20 years ago, will hospitals do integrative therapy, like for cancer or something, yeah. I would be like, no, I don't, I don't even know if we'll, we'll see that in our lifetime. But there are lots more hospitals that have integrative therapies within their, within their cancer section. Is it small or is it really, really amazing? No, but it's there. They're right. paying attention to it. They're, they're looking at it because of the amount, because of the internet, because of the amount of public demand for it. In, People just have to have all their ducks. Honestly, you just have to have all your ducks in a row. And then once you do, you start to push for change. Right. And I know totally. And, um, you know, so, so spay and neuter can affect longevity. And so, you know, unfortunately this, this overly simplistic approach leads to sort of like first world answer first first order answers but and that's great to first order problems but longevity is not a first order problem that's why you don't see your answer and everything you're talking about now that's why you don't see that on headlines or newspapers or magazines it's it's not quick and it's not succinct it's not sexy enough to sell but it's probably the answer everybody needs to hear what you're what you're talking about and i feel like that's a big disconnect we have in our society right now is that people want the quick answer and that it's not always going to be the right answer that works for them yeah and i think i think you know we have a lot of it's like it's like people it's kind of like people when you talk about vaccinating and people um you know anti-vaxxers and vaxxers and you know people bullying people on facebook because they didn't vaccinate their children or they're not vaccinating their animals or they're and and i think what i try to do even with vaccines is from my perspective at my clinic, I would say there was a much larger gray area, not anti-vaxxers and not vaxxers. The, 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 the larger population, which I also think is holds true for spay and neuters, are people in the gray zone wanting to know more, want to be, wanting to get educated, wanting to know more about what's best for their children, mm -hmm. what's best for their animals. They're not, they aren't, but they're being called anti-vaxxers. They're not anti-vaxxers. I had, I had lots and lots of people in my clinic that decided that they wanted to do the single round of parvo and a single round of distemper, but we didn't start until, you know, 10 to 14 weeks. And we did them individually and we separated them and we, you know, the whole, that whole nine yards, but then we never did them after that. And then I had a whole range of people that, you know, never wanted to do them. They, but the, what they, everybody had in common is they wanted to have the best education, the best information, and then they wanted to make a choice based on what they felt was best for their family, for their dog or their cat or their horse or whatever. And I think that holds true with 
everyone, but everyone gets stuck into categories and bullying starts. I think that's it holds true for spay and neuters. If yeah. someone says, Oh, I think I think, you know, early spay and neuter is horrible, then then they're lumping that all into one thing and all that's gonna do is ignite um uh, uh confrontation right it's just going to be like boom 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 rather than saying i don't think it's ideal for every animal i don't think it's ideal for every situation i can i can see its weight in certain countries i can see its weight in certain in certain situations but i don't think that it's a broad blanketed um uh 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 I don't think, I think it's too broad blanketed, right? I don't think it's, it's what we need to do for all animals. I think it's detrimental in that way. Yeah, right? exactly. And, you know, what we used to do is we would say to people, you know, if you're going to, if you want to spay, we would tell people exactly what it's going to be. Try to explain to them exactly what it would be like if you didn't spay, right? Like what, what might happen, what we had to look for. Yeah, how much more conscious we had to be yep. same with same with neutering and we would just say if they and then we would give them the option of waiting until their second just before their second heat was to us ideal right because it it decreases the incidence of of hormone induced cancers from like lack of hormone induced cancers but it also then supposedly decreases the lack of induced mammary cancer, right? Because they don't go into their second heat. So there was that fine line of making sure that we did it before they went into their second heat, but you know, as far after their first heat as we possibly could. Then we had ovarian sparing spays. And then for dogs, we had, um, we, I always said, can you, you know, wait till they're 18 months before you neuter them? unless you're starting to see when you go to a dog park they get beat up because they could be the sweetest things in the whole planet but if they're constantly being beaten up because they have their testicles and they smell different and they're different they are going to become reactive they're, they're they can only get beat up a certain amount of time and something's going to happen right like they're going to get scared or they're going to they're going to react or they're going to defend themselves and whatever yeah. I want to know uh, for dogs that, for dogs that you would spay and neuter at your clinic traditionally, um, would you then recommend glandular therapy, like giving the, like the homeopathic? Oh my gosh! Okay. Right away, they started in the day. Yeah. They started them like the day after. Yeah. On yeah. on and even the ones that we had ovary sparing, we still we we would play with that one a little bit more. Um, I would just wanted to say we did do some vasectomies. With, with male dogs, I didn't, I felt like it, it made them, yeah. I didn't find it to be beneficial. We didn't do very many, but the few that we did, I didn't find it to be very beneficial mm. at all. Because mm. it, it can, all it did was make you go, okay, well, they can't get a dog pregnant. They still wanted to mount everything. They still had the same you know, desire, they still have the same, like it doesn't, it doesn't change. It doesn't, I don't see that it gives any benefit other than you don't have to worry that it doesn't get something pregnant, but who wants someone's dog mounting it just because it wants to mount it? Like <laughs> it, it never really worked very well. To me, now, now that I know what I know, to me, when I see a dog that's spayed or neutered or neutered, you neutered would be more obvious, but my, the first thought in my head is, is that dog getting that a glandular or like, you know, standard process. I don't know if they have that in Canada. Standard process makes glandulars. Dr. Mercola has a whole body glandular. Um, so Susan in our group right now, in our, in our live, wants to know, she says, hi, Peter and Julie, my German shepherd dog had to be spayed at 13 months old because of pyometra. She's now eight years old. I'm interested in hormone replacement. What are your thoughts on hormone replacement like Dr. Mercola's canine hormone support along with whole body glandular? Susan, you and I have talked about uh, those two supplements in my experience. Um, and then she says, to add to my question, my girl Grace, she, would, she was diagnosed with autoimmune arthritis at age two. 
And to add more with what you said about the financial problem, we and our family have to deal with money that is spent. I would guess we have spent more than 10 grand, probably more like 15 and she has just turned eight years old. So, so the, the same one that had Pyometra also has auto, uh, two, two separate dogs. Yeah. One German shepherd dog speed at 13 months because of Pyometra. She's now eight and she's interested in hormone replacement. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I've, I recommend Dr. Becker's all the time and yep. Um, but I still think that the homeopathic one is incredible. Yeah. So reach out, Susan, reach out to Andrea and Julie, how do you know Andrea? Can you talk about your relationship there? Uh, well, she's my very best friend in the whole world. Uh, we work together. She was my right hand person. My, um, uh, she worked for me at my clinic for 13 years, I think, worked with me, and she uh, was a student of mine, and uh, like really like my right hand person at my at my practice for a very long time. She's incredible. She's, yeah, she's amazing. She takes. She's the one that took over my homeopathic cases um, when I left Vancouver. So she's really the only one that I trusted to my patient. Yeah, Susan, so not many people know this, but after my last live with Julie, I told her to hang on. And then I, I, I asked her the question, will you be Allie's homeopath? I basically proposed to Julie. I was like, how, you know, will you work with, be on my team? I want you on my team. Um, and, you know, she's like, and she, it was just, she's really busy. And she referred me to Andrea, who's also equally as amazing. And I know Andrea sometimes works with you, right? On really difficult cases. Oh yeah, like we we still connect, stay connected, yeah. and things like that. And we'll we'll she'll reach out to me sometimes with some really 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 difficult cases. Yeah. But I think I think that the the reason that I can't take cases anymore is because homeopathy is so individualized, right? right. Like when you're really dealing with something that's an individual, an individual base on an individual basis mm -hmm. um you know I, I was on call 24 hours seven days a week for 20 years wow and you're doing so much rescue work right now i don't know how you'd even fit that in <laughs> well and you know and everything else that i'm doing i'm doing my yeah. cancer research it, with dalhousie university and i'm doing and i want to hear about that too and and your farm and just running your farm that's a full-time job <laughs> don't forget what and my company adored bees your company and you gotta find time for you <laughs> um so yeah so susan reach out to andrea uh her website is andrea ring a n d r e a r i n g dot c a andrea ring dot c a and susan I, I have to just tell you something really fast autoimmune polyarthritis is probably what you're talking about i haven't had a case that we haven't been able to um i'm not going to ever say the word cure but I, we've never had a case that we haven't been able to fully stabilize and they've had, you know, uh, amazing lives and have been able to be normal with their activity. Um, Andrea, I'm sure can help you with that. The big thing with any kind of uh, chronic immune mediated arthritis is paying attention to when, like, you know, you talk about that jump for joints. Um, or even big dogs that have been spayed or neutered, large breed dogs that have been spayed and neutered. Uh, er, anytime you watch them and you go, ouch, that must have hurt. <laughs> you know, like they bash into each other or they're in agility or they go flying outside and you think that they may have some tweak something for Della, I would just give that to her right away, right? I would just give her squirts of it right away. And I, I believe in my heart that when you address the inflammatory, like an acute, I'm talking about inflammatory response, especially with an immune mediated thing, like you work on the chronic disease, but then you also deal with the acute immediacies right away. You don't let them, you don't let them linger or you don't wait till they're limping and you, and you immediately work on it. It's incredible what it can do. I just, I just want a, another shout out to your amazing team, Julie, for posting the links. I don't know if it's Stephanie or, or Kaylin, but posting the links to Andrea's contact. And thank you so much for doing that. You guys are, man.
Awesome. Um, another question from Kat. She said, just started jump for joints after two torn ACLs inside of a three month, inside of three months, three months, age 9.75. So almost 10 years old. Uh, this isn't making sense. Uh, not noticing much with the jump for joints suggestions. And she, she's had three or two ACL tears within three months. Inside of, inside of three months, aged, the dog is aged almost 10 years old. I'm not sure what uh, SCWT means. And it doesn't say, it says spade at blank months, but there's no number. So I'm assuming spade early mm -hmm. uh, and, you're, and, you're try, and you're using jumper joints, but not noticing much. So with jumper joints too, it's, it really is when you're dealing with two um, like ACLs like that, it's not, we're not sort of dealing with the, like your regular arthritis stuff. Cause I believe that ACLs are immune mediated. Sometimes there are injuries, but I would, I would personally say that the majority of time they're either immune mediated or uh, a causation of something chronic. And I think that what you have to do with the jump for joints is sometimes you can, you need to give it four or five times a day until mm -hmm. you start seeing a difference, right? And because it's not an NSAID, it's not a drug, it's not going to suppress anything. It takes a while for it to, especially with something like that. But if, if, if she has had two within three months, I would be looking at using jump for joints for sure. But then looking like maybe contacting Andrea or looking at something that's definitely more chronic, right? More chronic disease. So, you know, when you talk about cellular stuff, you talk about if she's been spayed, I would be doing um, hormone, hormone support, like through with Dr. Becker's hormone support with that. Lots of cellular support, like with phytoplankton and really good food. Um, that's, you know, just like treating the underlying or dealing with the underlying issues. Mm -hmm. And then with the immediacy of trying to prevent arthritis, trying to prevent chronic, chronic um, mobility issues, right? At the same time. Right. Another product that I really, really love of yours, I've also got here on a bag of ice because they're going to the fridge. Uh, I use liver tonic. Uh, I go through one bottle once a season like that you yeah. recommended in your video. And then I have on, this is not available in the States, easy peasy. Oh. Uh, Andrea shipped me a couple bottles because I give it to Allie because she has incontinence due to her hormonal uh, imbalance, Plechner syndrome. Um, so this has worked wonderful for her. Um, and you can also contact Andrea for the easy peasy too. I don't know if you can order it if you're in the States from the Canadian website. I don't know if that's possible, but how come it's not available in the States? Because we just we just started manufacturing in the states, right? So we couldn't. It's sort of like we just couldn't get everything up and running all at the same time. And uh, we were shipping over, and then there's certain things that we can't ship over that's in in that product. We can't get it into the states from Canada. Hmm. So we've had to sort of just adjust some stuff to be able to get it over there. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's really good. the The other thing that's that I, I, I didn't think we were going to talk about, about products at all. No, I, I use, I use so many of your products and like everything that can go wrong from spay and neuter, you have a product that can address that okay, symptom. So when you were talking about your feeding, feeding, um, fresh poop and healthy poop. Yes. So one thing I can say now is, and it's pretty exciting that, you know, our phytosphora, Yep. which is, so Phytosflora is the only canine species oriented probiotic, right? And, and that's because it's made from canine feces. It's the only probiotic that's actually yeah. made from canine feces. But they've gone through such rigorous uh, research that now they can actually make claims. It's one, like the, one of the first things, first times that a probiotic for a dog has ever, ever been able to make a claim. They can make claims that it's immune modulating. Mm -hmm. So immune modulating for any single person that's listening is probably one of the most important things that you have to remember because we all think about boosting our immune systems, even with the coronavirus, right? We're, 
we're, we're all going boost, 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 but that's not what we want to always do. And especially for animals that have autoimmune diseases, you don't want to boost their immune system. You want to modulate their immune system. So that's why they're go, they go on steroids, right? So steroids suppress the immune system. So any kind of dogs that have been diagnosed with allergies or immune mediated polyarthritis or like the list goes on and on and on of what's immune modulate or immune um, immu uh, autoimmune diseases. So it has been proven and the health claims are now that that particular probiotic is an immune modulator. So it can, it can create, a, if an immune system goes too high, it can actually bring it down. If it goes too low, it brings it up. So it modulates the immune system. It's, it, oh my gosh, I'll send you, maybe we can post it. I'm going to send you um, the latest data that we're now allowed to say about, yeah. about that probiotic. That, I love that. that it, it is, for anyone that is honestly concerned about microbiome for their dogs. I mean, they should be. I can't even tell, like, I can't even, it, it, it gives the same benefit of doing healthy fecal, like transplant and things like that, without any concern of any of anything that could go wrong that way, Right. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's, it's one of the things I'm most, one of the most, well, I'm proud of everything, but um, that we're seeing more and more and more. And I'm really lucky because the company that I'm working with, with that is investing hundreds of thousands of dollars into research, which doesn't happen with animals, right? Maybe. With dogs and cats. So they're, they're, so that we, we aren't just saying it does this and it's the only species oriented probiotic and it's this and it's that they we can we can now make health claims which is i don't know that there's much out there now uh, even with animal animal supplements that can truly make a health claim and we can so we're going to be posting that on our website too of those claims of what those claims are and i'm pretty proud of it because like i said not a lot of people could put the money into it they put yeah. more money into marketing and being able to sell it than taking the money and putting it actually into research you have a beautiful company and so many amazing products and i'm always sending people to adored beast and and because i mean it's just so many things that like for example you know i'm uh dr roman's become one of my one of my close friends and frequently we'll go on a hike with our dogs together uh because she lives in the woods you know, and, and we'll go on a hike with the dogs around, the, do a pond loop, and or one of her dogs will will poop, and she'll say, oh, Peter, go, you know, that's here, take that. So literally, when it's still steaming and warm and fresh, I'll feed it to Ellie. And to me, that's like gold, like that's the best, especially when her dogs are in heat and the hormones in that poop. I don't know, I don't even know if science knows, like if, 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 if what kind of benefit that can have to a dog that's hormonally imbalanced but well, i don't know i mean we know that the microbiome though is is vital for hormone right? right and and what i find the most everybody finds different things of the microbiome more interesting than other people right for me in that research for the last 20 years that i've been doing with microbiome is its intelligence like it just it gives like i'm just saying that it gave me goosebumps yeah you know it, it <laughs> like, me too it, like, it, it, it literally speaks to everything in your body, yep. right? Your brain, every organ, your cells, your hormones. It, it has an ability to communicate. So it is an, it's incredibly important. And I think that that's why we're seeing the kind of things that we're seeing with, with Phytosplora and that canine species uh, probiotic or like the species and the strain is because it's, it's intellect comes from a dog, not a person. So when you feed Phytos flora, you're giving your dog the intellect, right? Of the microbiome specifically for dogs. Right. Not, not the micro, and I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that other probiotics don't work. I am seriously not saying that. But what I find so fascinating is that when we're looking at the research that we're doing with it and, 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 and the incredible results it's having, I truly in my heart believe it's because we're giving 
the intelligence of the canine species mm -hmm. bacteria yeah. Yeah. rather than giving the human back the human strain and and phyllos flora is in my rotation for Allie. it's you know you know fresh poop from dr roman's dog almost on a daily basis Phyto, not all at once, obviously, but yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll use Phytos Flora. I'll use the Dr. Mercola probiotic. I yeah. love uh, the cultured coconut, fermented organic coconut kefir yeah. that you can now order from the States. Um, also, I reached out to White Oak Pastures in Bluffton, Georgia, and uh, they practice regenerative agriculture. And I had them, I sent them a big bottle and they filled it with healthy soil because the yeah. animal pooping yeah. and peeing in soil and, and I would sprinkle a little bit of that on Allie's food. So literally just doing as much as you can, I think. Well, that, yeah, that, that mimics more nature. Ancestral environment. Like, in, yeah, in, in and nature. Billy's food, right? Like, like yeah. answer yeah. pets and things yeah. like that. Like doing, doing that whole um, trying to mimic yep. what would be happening in nature. They wouldn't be eating the same thing in nature. Well, they would be in a way, right? Mm -hmm. But that thing wouldn't be eating the same. Yeah, right? and, they're, so and they're, they would be eating something, the diversity and- And, and it would be covered in dirt. Oh, yeah, I've been, I wrote about, it's all about the dirt. Yeah. And dogs naturally like a year and where, a half ago. Where, the, the, fe the feces in Fido's flora, where is that coming from? Your dogs? No, it, it's coming from a dog. Like, like a dog that we used, a healthy dog yeah. that we used. Now coming down the pike is a, a whole bunch of pretty oh, exciting yeah, things. Like we're, we're getting more ancestral. We're getting, like, we're getting feline. Love we're getting equine. Love it. Julie, I don't know that. how much time you have left. We have a couple go more ahead. questions. Do you, have, do you think you can? Yeah, okay. go ahead. So uh, Donna Middleton wants to know, oh. my Ruby has, hi, Donna. My Ruby has false pregnancies where she becomes less active and a bit off her food and her breasts swell up and she becomes bloated. Her, re her recent, uh, I, her, her recent something was much better as her false pregnancy was not as bad. She has been bred once and was taken from me to do so. Once her, once she, once she became pregnant, she completely stopped eating for the entire pregnancy. They um. fed her. Whelping did not go well. My vet said I needed to spay her or breed her again. She is a lovely girl. And if I found just the right male, I would breed her. However, I'm extremely concerned about her loss of appetite during the pregnancy due to the unbalanced hormones. Is there a remedy I can use for this or should I spay her? She is four. Ooh. Holy. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a hard call. That's, I can only say, you know what, for me, I can only say what I would do if they were my personal dog, right? Like I would try and support per a person in the best that what they really wanted. But if it was my dog, I wouldn't breed her again. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I just, I'm I, with you there. yeah. As sad as that might seem, you know, like I, sometimes I, I, I often thought about breeding Della because she was like the absolute love of my life. Yeah. And then I didn't. And it's just, you know, it just is what it is. But um, that's what I was going to say too, is that when Della did get pyometra, I'm convinced it's because of Henry, right? Because I, I had a dog, she was around a dog that was intact. So it made her feel like she was pregnant way, way more, right? Like it, it, it stimulated her natural, her natural rearing hormones to shut down, close off, start making babies right um so when you're around you know i think that's even a higher incidence of pyometra like their their stress levels how much they're going out and running if they're around male dogs right if they're actually around that scent like that smell i think a lot of a lot of those things are you know are key points but i am going to put that on like i said that's going to go on the website people can read about it Okay. And, and remedies that they can use to try and prevent it and remedies they can use at first signs to see if they can derail it, when to take them into the vet, blah, blah, blah. Susan, Susan adds from her last question, uh, Grace has a lot of atrophy in her hips and hind legs. It's causing major infection around her vulva. Oh, um, so that's, that's like, you, 
she's eight and a half, but I would still be looking at, you know, adding as much um, collagen, right? Collagen and um, strength, you know, collagen protein, trying to build her muscle mass back up. And, and that is something that we do see with the spay and neuter remedy is that I don't know now that she's nine years old, but the animals that were on it didn't, didn't their, their muscle mass didn't decrease. Cause that's part of a, that's, that's definitely hormonal. Mm. Part of it is hormonal. Donna, Donna adds, I have an intact male, so it would concern me not to spare. Yeah. So yes. I would agree. Yeah. But then don't just spare. And like my mom would say, throw the baby up with the bath water spare, right. and then, and then make sure that you're doing hormone support. Wow. Well, this has been a fantastic live, Julie. Do you have anything you want to add before we, before we, uh, no, not really. Just can, I have one last question for you. And this has been really hard for me to get an answer from, and you might not have the answer, but maybe you have a thought. So, <laughs> um, so we all know about Maggie, the dog from Australia lived to be 30 and she was on the organic dairy farm and ate placenta after birth and dead calves and uh, healthy soil. And so when I heard that, of course, being the crazy person I am, I went to my local farm or an organic farm down the road and I asked them for, and I know the placenta, they told me that calves can choke on it and die or and it can also attract predators. And they give, the, they give them the opportunity to eat it, but if they don't, then they get rid of it. And so they saved it for me. Wow. Cows eat it. The yes. Cows eat it, and they can. The babies can choke on it. Yeah, they can choke on it and die. The cows. So anytime they had it available, they would give it to me, and I'd go pick it up and out of the fridge in the bucket, and I'd have my gloves on and be cutting it and bottling it into glass jars. And every day, I'd give Allie a little chunk of it in her food. For a dog that has an estrogen imbalance, like a cortisol estrogen imbalance, so like Allie's got low cortisol, elevated estrogen, can feeding more estrogen be problematic? And the same kind of goes for when I feed Allie's the poop from Dr. Roman's dogs that are in heat, it could be full of estrogen. Like, you know, estrogen can also have protective properties I hear too, against cancer and other things. So the whole thing to me is confusing. I know the adrenals can compensate and it can be toxic estrogen. So what do you think about that? Um, I think that... I, I really think that moderation, right? So I feel like um, I, I, would, I would step back because you're right. Like there's, uh, and there's all different kinds of estrogen, right. right? There's different types of estrogen, estrogen without progesterone and aldosterone and all the rest of them, right? That's why if you were to go on a bioidentical hormone, they're not, they're not just going to give you, as a woman, they're not just going to give you estrogen. They're going to give you, all the rest of the sex hormones as well, because they're also not there. So when you look at her cortisol levels being low and her estrogen levels being high, that's like what's causing that, right? Like, I mean, from a, if she was to go to a, 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 a human uh, functional medicine doctor and, and be put on sex hormones, she wouldn't just be put on estrogen, right? Mm -hmm. She would be put on probably large amounts of progesterone because progesterone can raise cortisol levels. Mm -hmm. So um, I would, I, I don't, I don't know the answer of whether you should be giving her a lot of the placenta, but I think that if you do, it would be, you would want to be doing small amounts of it, mm -hmm. but her cortisol is really low too, is, um, uh, you know, giving her stuff like ashwagandha and giving her stuff that, that supports her adrenal glands, not mm -hmm. just estrogen levels. Right. Right. Is important. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, making sure that her adrenal glands are really, really supported. Yep. Thank So I, I redid the endocrine immune blood test uh, and her levels were, were great. Um, her cortisol is within normal range. I'm doing licorice root, a tincture. Yeah. Um, yep. raises yeah and um but before i could get so before i could successfully manage her and balance i had to do i had to ch i had to work on her absorption she wasn't absorbing anything or anymore she was she was eating everything and she was ravenous but she was losing weight and getting skinnier and bonier and looked emaciated 
So every, every week I have to give her vitamin B complex and C and um, it's just an injectable and she can absorb her food. And I found out through trial and error how much extra B12 she needs. And um, through talking to groups, you know, other people that have dogs with EPI and pancreatic insufficiency. Oh, we should do another live then because um, SIBO can cause that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I mean, yeah, yeah. It can yeah. Cause that, that inability to, to absorb. absorb. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. It's I mean, also, it's also every dog with EPI probably, I shouldn't say every, chances are many, many, many dogs with EPI also have SIBO. And that's, that's why they're constantly going on antibiotics. And if, if your dog is SIBO, then doing a probiotic could be harmful, right? You want to do a more complete, like a fecal transplant? No. Um, you want to, you want to, what, what happens with SIBO is that SIBO works with your prebiotic, right? Like your indigestible fiber. So, so the, the microbiome that lives in the large intestine should not be living in the small intestine. And for whatever reason, the, it, it becomes transferent and it, it winds up, even if it's good, even if it's, the, even if it's amazing uh, microflora that would do wonders for you in your large bowel, if it gets into the small bowel, it can be incredibly detrimental, right? Yeah. So when you feed the, when you feed a probiotic and you feed a prebiotic or indigestible fiber, it just flourishes. So I, I kind of have this thing where I try and, because they're equally as important, right? So you can't kind of starve one to help, help do another one. So soil-based probiotics are really good for SIBO. Um, but when you, when you look at it being a dog compared to how SIBO is treated with people, what I do with, with, with things like that is I do really, really a little bit of, of, first of all, I would check to see if it is SIBO. And if it is, then I kind of do this, this radical diet thing where you're, you're concentrating on low, lower bowel and then the next month you're concentrating on upper then you're concentrating on lower then you're concentrating on upper right and then the yeast thing comes into that play as well so it's this fine tune game <laughs> where you're where, where you're supporting one and then and then depleting one and then supporting one and depleting one supporting one and depleting one and I did a lecture um, on that at in Chicago um, last year, and it it was a long lecture. And I'm I'm in the middle right now of writing that up and putting it in much easier to understand. Okay, this is this is how I look at this. This is what I would do, and that's going to go on our website. As You're well. so knowledgeable. I feel like this is a, this is what's missing from a lot of like you know what I mean, veterinary medicine, especially conventional, like you're the first person really that I've heard talk about SIBO and how many dogs are suffering with this. Could, do you think ozone therapy, do you think ozone therapy could, could remedy that imbalance? It, ha it wouldn't hurt. It doesn't hurt mm -hmm. for sure. But, but I think what you have to remember, if you're feeding, if you're feeding a bacteria that flourishes the lower bowel and you have a dog with SIBO or you have a body that has SIBO, you have to be really careful, like really, really careful. So, so that's why it's like, it's like power of observation. And I, and I know we're, we're like getting long on time and stuff now, but in that talk that I did about what, what am I doing right now with Corona? I'm, I'm really, really trying to, to um, uh, educate my five and six cents because I feel like we are always distracted, right? We're, we're never, we never sit in our thing. And I think I've, every single solitary time I've lectured, every single, so every single patient I've seen of the thousands and thousands and thousands of patients that I've seen, I tell people to try and 
increase their power of observation because you will be able to tell what's what's going on with your animal right you, you subtle changes are massive so when it comes to SIBO that's really important because I feel like you know it, it still doesn't diagnose very often I think it's underdiagnosed a lot in animals and with cats dogs everything people and I feel like if you if you wind up doing these not tests but um, ways of, of feeding you will quickly see if you're paying attention what's happening you know you'll see it in the stool you'll see it in their energy you'll see it in their coat you'll see it you'll see you'll see subtle changes like maybe less burping less farting less gurgling less whatever you know make make really clear notes prior to and then watch and then what will happen is you'll get a sense of what truly is going on in your dog's gut right because you'll be able to watch and you're sort of in control of it and mm -hmm. i'm not saying you know like uh, the only scary part of of that is the sort of not maybe being balanced right because you have to you you the d diet i mean but it's for such a short period of time that you should be able that you know it really we shouldn't be wor too worried about imbalancing something in that short of a time for what we could have to gain in animals that are sick so if something's if you can tell there's something wrong with your animal and you can't get to the bottom of it and you've been doing you know yeasty beast and you've been doing um you know leaky gut and you've been doing my you know you've been doing poop pills and you've been really doing tricky cases yeah everything and something's just not seeming right you know there could be a chance that that they have SIBO so if you if you if you start to pay attention to that and look at that you'll see quite quickly if you're really watching your dog you know you know you understand your dog and then you'll be able to get a sense of it you know and all of these animals that have something called um antibiotic uh like diarrhea that that gets better from antibiotics so like with with epi and they're you know they're they're going okay and then all of a sudden they get diarrhea and then they go on antibiotics and then they get better on the antibiotics chances are their epi is balanced but they actually have SIBO mm -hmm. because of it initially because of it and that that's why the antibiotics are helping and they're not helping the they're not helping it because they've got diarrhea they're helping deal with the bacteria that's in the small intestine wow such a such a huge topic um julie thank you for everything you you almost about three hours thank you so much i think a lot a lot of us have uh xenia says i could listen to you all day i agree um if I could just have you on surround speakers and just listen to your knowledge all day, I would. Um, Justin says it's been a very educational talk, brings up a lot of good questions and addresses some very important concerns for our dog's health and longevity. Um, a replay link will be posted. Um, I'm sure your amazing team is going to be on that, Julie, as well as will I. Um, if anyone maybe we can even break it down, like my team is so awesome at doing that. Like maybe we can even break the recordings down because it's on Zoom, right? That'd be awesome. So that people can watch it in bits so that it's not so overwhelming. Absolutely. For anyone in my group that is new to Julie and Adored Beast, you can find her at Adored Beast. Is that backwards? No. Okay, adoredbeast.com adored or .ca if you're in Canada. Um, amazing company, beautiful company. And uh, yeah, Julie, thank you so much. for You had such a tremendous impact on my life and Allie's life and I consider you a good friend and such a mentor and thank you for introducing me to Andrea um, anyone you guys should contact Andrea she's wonderful she did a amazing consult with me so deep and detailed on for a chronic case and she sent stuff right to my door um, and she's just amazing so she really helped me understand homeopathy and uh, you know the cussing and the different remedies and when to give it, you know, proving and all that stuff that my vet couldn't explain to me because she didn't have the time to. Like, so it's really worth investing in Andrea or a homeopath um, because it's just a great modality to have. And mm -hmm. I think it's part of, it's part of the, you know, I think having that another tool like that in your toolbox 
just like I also invested in an ozone machine. That's another amazing thing to invest in. Um, you know, we got to be expanding our knowledge here. So Julie, thank you so much. You're welcome. Hang in there, everybody. Big thank hugs. you. Everybody stay safe and hopeful and we'll all get out of this. I'm, 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 we're very resilient. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. You have a wonderful day. Okay. Hopefully talk soon.